it is hard, and I, I say all of this perfectly openly, it's hard and probably harder for us a lot than you lot um, when a friend or a family member dies because we don't believe that we will ever see them again. Okay? And when we don't believe that you know, there is any further to that story. The platitudinous part that you wrote about in that tweet I, I get a bit worried when Christians get a bit too sort of cocksure themselves and go, we don't need to worry, someone's died, it's all all right, they're going to heaven and be with Jesus. That is not what the New Testament frames it. We're told, yes, we grieve and yes, we mourn, but we don't mourn as people without hope. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the show. If you're watching here on YouTube, do make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, all the usual stuff. And of course, you can get our newsletter if you follow the info with today's show. We'll even send you a free ebook when you register. Today, we're asking, are religious funerals empty and platitudinous? Ian Dunt and Andy Bannister join me. Ian is a columnist at the I newspaper. He also hosts the Oh God, What Now? and Origin Story podcasts and is author of How to Be a Liberal. Um, he's an atheist. And as you'll find out, he had some interesting things to say during the Queen's state funeral. Andy is an author and speaker and director of Solas Centre for Public Christianity. Well, last month, the Queen's state funeral was watched by probably one of the biggest TV audiences in history, packed with ceremony and symbolism, a deeply Christian funeral that reflected the late monarch's own deeply held faith. But while it was underway, Ian Dunt tweeted, I'm glad religion brings solace to those who are suffering at funerals. But throughout my life, I've always wondered how. It's all so terribly empty and platitudinous, a cardboard shield against existential despair. Well, that tweaked my interest and uh, it prompted me to invite Andy Bannister to write a response piece to Ian, arguing that in the end, ultimately, maybe everything we do is empty and meaningless in a, in a world without God. But Ian was very generous in his response to the article. So I thought, well, let's make a show of it. So Ian and Andy both joining me on the programme today as we talk about the religiosity that marked a lot of the mourning around the Queen and indeed the state funeral as well. And to ask Ian as an atheist, what sort of barrier against existential defence? despair he prefers so uh, it's going to be an interesting show um uh ian um and andy w welcome along uh, ian you've not been on the show before so and and perhaps people know you through twitter i know you're a you're a big user of twitter but um tell us a bit about yourself your background and, and where you stand on all things religious yeah um i'm a sort of liberal extremist really um uh, i'm a columnist an author broadcaster is that what we call podcasting? Broadcasting? I it's think you're allowed to call it broadcasting. broadcasting. It's the new Let's broadcasting, it. isn't it? I, I think in this kind of sort of social setting, I imagine there'd be quite a lot of agreement <laughs> with that. Yes. Yeah, so, so broadcaster as well. Um, religion. So was I was baptised Catholic. I went to Church of England schools, fairly religious, but not overly so. Um, became quite, quite heavily Christian at about the age of 14 which lasted me through to about 16 and then rejected it pretty comprehensively. And since then, my, my spiritual views have been largely unchanged. The only thing that I suppose um, alters is probably I was quite a cross, angry atheist in my younger years. As I get a bit older, I'm a bit less cross and angry and just generally think, especially in England, less so in other countries, but especially in England, they're not really doing too much damage. So, so we'll just leave them to tick along. <laughs> what what kind of inspired the cross and angry phase was 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 it that would were you particularly angry at religious people for any reason well i would still argue that a tremendous amount of human suffering has taken place in the history of our species by virtue of uh religion's demands on humanity i mean if you go through the centuries of you know on sexuality or, or on any other number of other matters um i think when you're younger you're crosser probably about people who don't agree with you full stop on any mm -hmm. subject. And as you get older, you probably start to mellow a little bit with that. Um, and then I suppose there's an element of, I think your transition, and I'm obviously, I'm speaking from an atheist perspective here, sure. so of course it would be different to you, but your transition out of that belief system um, involves a certain amount of irritation that the entirety of your childhood was, was filled up with people going, <laughs> this is the case. So when you decide, well, this isn't the case, uh, you're obviously sort of, sort of quite irritated about the fact that the whole, it's seemingly of society at that point and the school system and family were all stressing very strongly that it would be the case that obviously your, your rejection has to be quite robust in the early stages and, and, and then can placate a little bit. Hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's helpful background to, to you, what you do and the obviously the journey you've taken on the religious front. Um, Andy, 
uh, be great to have a reminder of what you're doing and uh, the role you have with Solas as well. Yeah, so uh, always good to be back, uh, kind of Justin. So um, yeah, I've been back in the in the country now for six years. Before that, we were in Canada for a long time, then came back over to take over uh, Solas from a guy called David Robertson, who'd set it up, known, I think, to listeners of Unbelievable. And so Solas, really, we do a couple of things. Uh, we, we like to take the message of Christianity, of Jesus, and get it out of the four walls of the churches and into the public square. So we help churches and other groups put on events in cafes and pubs and curry houses, universities, uh, schools, you name it, that kind of thing, to have these kind of discussions really about, you know, life, the universe and everything. And then the other part of what we do is helping, I think, help trying to help equip Christians to just talk more naturally about what they believe. Because I think the great thing is whatever you believe, I love the way, you know, Ian put it, is to go, you know, not to get angry and frustrated about those who don't think the same as you. Learn to talk well to them learn to talk naturally have good conversations about the stuff that matters and then we do a lot of that online so i'd agree with you podcasting is definitely broadcasting <laughs> um <laughs> I, I i i appreciate everything you said there andy and it's very much you know what this show is about creating good conversations and i, I was really pleased that that ian and you were up for having the conversation with with andy today um let's start with the queen's funeral um I think we were all watching it on the day, as were millions, billions of other mm. people. Um, uh, maybe, Andy, what were your responses to the Queen's funeral uh, as you watched it yourself? Well, a couple of things, um, really. It was interesting watching it with such a diverse age range. We were, I was sat down with a group of people ranging in age from sort of, you know, early, uh, late 60s, almost early 70s, right through to my son, who was seven. And what was interesting, actually, is I thought I thought the younger ones, I thought my son particularly would get all fidgety, wouldn't cope. He was fascinated. Um, uh, you know, I think we did, you know, as, as one of my as one of my friends put it, who's American, he said, you Brits do pomp and circumstance really well. It was quite a spectacle, I think, is the is the first thing uh, that really struck me. Um, I was more moved than I thought I would be, which surprised me. I'm probably if you'd pushed me. I'm a monarchist, but you've had, you'd have had to push me um, if I was had to come down one side of the, the divide. So I thought I'd be interested as, a, as an observer of history. I was much more moved, I think, than I thought I'd be. That real sense of, you know, whether you're a fan or not a fan, the Queen has been there ever since I was a kid. She's been part of the kind of sort of back, the background, and that that has changed. Um, and then I think, obviously, as a Christian watching it, I think, you know, some of what, uh, you know, some of the way the funeral was constructed, some of the content... Uh, was 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 really I think yeah, mm. really rich, really deep. Had some great conversations with sort of friends afterwards who don't share my my faith, who were yeah. struck by yeah. by things. Um, so yeah, I think I think quite an quite an event actually, and it's rare you get to watch something that you realise this is history right yeah. in front of you as well. Yeah, mm. I mean, I, I fully expected it to be you know obviously a Christian ceremony, uh, but like you, I, I found myself surprised. Actually, in the the bit that got me, the bit where I, I got a lump in my throat, mm -hmm. was when those bagpipes started as they brought the the the, the gun carriage yeah. to to the abbey, and suddenly it was like, oh wow, that's that's the chills. It's it's it felt sort of yeah. Anyway, Ian, um, uh, what did you think of the funeral? I'm with you on the bagpipes. I generally hate the bagpipes. I think it's just the most <laughs> dreadful. Thing. But but I really loved them all the way through the day, and I really like that drumming. Whatever that, mm. I don't know what, what that beat is. Mm. It's very, to call it a beat sounds odd, but it was mm. very, it, I found it tremendously beautiful and I really yeah. liked the bagpipe and then this, and the sort of single bagpiper yeah, at the end, at the very end. fading away. Mm. I loved all of that. Unfortunately, that was pretty much all, all, that's the sum total of the things I loved about that day. Um, so I found the ceremony just completely absent of human content. Um, and in stark contrast, and I suspect, I could be wrong, I suspect that this is a, a sort of metaphor that's going to work throughout this discussion. Mm -hmm. In stark contrast to the Q, with a capital Q, uh, which, had, which was full of human content, which was personal, and which was ground up. I mean, obviously, it was organized from the top. But the, the, the thing that meant something to people in the queue and watching the queue, more importantly, was that it was individual decisions and individual connections and individual expressions of something with a very diverse assessment of why they were there and why they wanted to be there and what they liked about it. These were not all, you know, colonels who read the Telegraph, who loved the monarchy, right? It was a much more diverse range than that. Um, and after days of that, which had made me tremendously emotional, hmm. um, it just felt like this cold, hard slab of sort of uh, uh, 
I want to use the word inhuman, but of course, that's not what I mean, of sort of non-human celebration without any mm. of the personal ornament. Now, of course, there was a ceremony later on, I think in Windsor, which was the personal ceremony where they would go over the life. And this is the state sort of religion. I get that. But nevertheless, it felt to me, because that period felt like a very healthy period of a national conversation with itself, mm. which is really the most important thing that monarchy does to allow a country to talk to itself. It felt like a really healthy, decent one. And then for it to end on that note, I, I thought it was quite sad and it felt pretty empty. Mm, interesting. Uh, and obviously you, you shared that on, on Twitter. What sort of reaction? I share everything on Twitter. I'm, I'm, I'm no longer <laughs> capable of having internal thought. And in fact, sometimes when I try, I occasionally say something to the missus and she's just like, can't you tweet this? I mean, I don't see why I should have it inflicted upon me. Like, <laughs> um, what, so what were some of the responses you, you got to that particular tweet? Oh, mate, I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know. I don't really, um, <laughs> I don't really see the, the replies very much. So I, I sort That's of, right. I largely avoid that. And it's sort of rigged so that I really only see the people that follow me. And even then, yeah. only certain of the ones I, so I don't really, I, I don't know. Well, when you've got that many followers, you know, you've got to, you've got to, you know, discriminate. Sure. A bit it's also that the... Twitter is, uh, let's face it, a cesspit of hate <laughs> and vitriol. And uh, a lot of the time it can be quite healthy to back but, away. But from actually, um, you know, I, I, I thought, that, that you actually engaged when, when I did see you engaging with some of the responses in, in a very healthy way, actually, as far as Twitter goes. Um, Andy obviously responded with an article. Andy, do you want to just um, sort of summarise kind of some of the points you were making in this article you wrote for us? Well, I have to confess straight away, I didn't actually see Ian's original tweet. It was only when uh, it was only when uh, you guys at sort of Premier reached out and went, we desperately need someone to write something quickly. <laughs> Which actually partly felt a little inauthentic. Here's Ian, who's carefully shaped his thing within, what is it now, 280 characters, I think they allow us on, on Twitter. I forget what we're up to now. And there was I with 2,500 words. So it felt a rather long response uh, to a tweet. But I, but yeah, I think my, my, my piece centred around, I think, I think I've, I appreciated, initially I appreciated obviously some of what, what Ian had shared. I found the, um, I found the existential despair thing Fascinating. I found that, that that reference you put in your tweet to a cardboard shield against existential despair. First thing that struck me as interesting is that recognition there was there was existential despair because I I have some atheist kind of friends who I think you know sometimes carry on as if life is all roses and kittens and rainbows and puppies, um, but actually to recognise that actually uh, life is pretty bleak and there are some there are some consequences that potentially flow. Uh, from atheism. I can imagine we may talk about some of those as this recording goes on. So I think that was the first thing uh, that struck me. And then the other thing I, I talked about in the article, which segues into something you just said a moment ago, the sort of platitudinous uh, reference, which actually deeply impressed me that someone could get that word into a tweet. <laughs> actually, most tweets are single syllables, but you did really well there. Um, your point just now, actually, I don't entirely disagree, actually, that there was, there was a lot in the funeral I did like. It, there was that distant piece to it too and it would have been you know interesting to have been a fly on the wall at that very personal family so you know piece that went on at st george's chapel which obviously we weren't there because it wouldn't then have been personal and family and i think i acknowledge in my article that i think again both atheists and christians are not immune from at times leading towards the platitudinous i think twitter does encourage that that is one of, you know i'm on twitter a lot not quite as much as you but the same thing it's often you catch oneself thinking would I really have said that to a mate down the pub? Um, and just being a little careful uh, about that. But then I think also, of course, I, I lent into, you know, that question of is it, is it true that Christianity, that religion is a, is a cardboard shield? I, I, don't, I don't think it is, actually. I think, I think Christianity has been particularly, obviously, which we're speaking for, has been, has been battle tested. I mean, the people I'm, I, I'm impressed the most in the life when I come across those who have Christian faith, who live in some of the most horrendous parts of the world having traveled in you know places where being a christian can cost you a lot north korean friends and things who have paid a lot um and actually would say it's been battle tested and it's the thing that carried them them through and i do think it's therefore if i was going to be cheeky and push back slightly i think it's atheism has the challenge here there is a meaning challenge um in in atheism and having taught philosophy for some years before going to the more public side of things it's interesting you know, i have a you know quote after quote after quote from you know, particularly atheists of the previous generation, um, the sort of Dawkins variety, I think the new atheism ducked some of this. But if you look at the Sartres, the Camus, the Russells, the Nietzsches, that set, I think there was more of a willingness to recognise life is 
crap actually and and the universe is dark and cold and empty and alone and you need to man up and face it you know Nietzsche's famous parable of the madman you know if you throw God out you do wipe away the horizon there is no up nor down left nor right own it dudes um, that last part was a paraphrase I don't think he actually said own it dudes, but um, probably more syllables Nietzsche in the Twitter gen- in the Twitter age would have been quite the thing to see actually yeah, but absolutely um, <clears throat> Well, I mean, that's that's a helpful summary of the article. And, and Ian, you've obviously read it and you generously, you know, retweeted it and, and gave some commentary on it. Um, I, I remember one of the comments you did give to it was you, you're surprised at how people of faith think that atheists can't have meaning mm. without God. Um, so so that was obviously your initial reaction to it. Do, do you want to expand on that? And, and yeah, but of, let me say yeah. some nice things first. I mean, firstly, it was very polite and it was very well mm. written um, and using simple wording, which to me goes a, like a very, very long in, way. Instead given... of platitudinous, you mean? Exactly, exactly. Well, I, I edited a website for 12 years, I think. So I am. Uh, uh, it is easy to romance me through simple wording. Simple wording <laughs> is what someone does when they really understand what it is that they're talking about. So it, it's a very, very good sign. Um, um, the, the meaning element, um, I, su- I suppose that, I mean, you've, you've listed, uh, um, <laughs> I think four, well, three, three of those philosophers were deeply depressed human beings, <laughs> really, you know, really struggled with the, with the darkness, um, that they had. The other one you mentioned, I think was Russell, wasn't it? I mentioned uh, Bertrand, but Russell is a fascinating barrel of contradictions but um he was but he's, he's a much less depressing figure and is about to sort of you know he's, he's a much more fun guy if you had to pick one of these four people to go to the pub with you're obviously going to go with Bertram Russell um, you know, that's funny I use exactly the same illustration which is interesting so if I had a time machine, oh, in a, a t- <laughs> time machine at a pub crawl it would be Bertram Russell of course of course <laughs> I mean, Sorry, I've read on, the history of Western philosophy it's one of the best written philosophy books I've, I've ever read mm. his chapter on Rousseau is it is laugh out loud, funny, and extremely intellectually satisfying, uh, and also completely correct. He absolutely executes him. Um, so, uh, the problem I suppose I have with the meaning basis is that, and I don't want to go too posh with this discussion, or you just stop me when it's getting too posh or whatever, but I mean, essentially, it's, it's a reversion back to that kind of Plato idea of there must be an absolute for there to be meaning in the day-to-day content that we experience, right? So how do we know what speed is unless there is an absolute Mm. idea of speed that exists somehow, a perfect version of speed? I just, that has never made any sense to me at all. I know what speed is by virtue of the fact that object A is faster than object B. It is relative to to, to to other instances. And I think you can say the same for any quality. Therefore follows that you are not, um, removed from meaning by virtue of the fact that there is no absolute above you. It is done simply by the content you have in front of you. So the meaning is in humanity. I don't need there to be a God to find meaning in humanity. I find it in them anyway and in my relationship with them. And the, the need for an external objective scale or test or comparison or framework for that seems to me to be unnecessary. Mm-hmm. Andy? Yeah, I- let me let me respond to that. I mean, the speed is an interesting is an interesting uh, analogy, isn't it? Because the thing is actually, although you can still choose the object, you can still see that object X is faster than than than, than, than object Y. You know, without having this sort of universal out here, you're still at a scale, right? You're still measuring them against something. In this case, velocity. And I think the challenge then becomes when you start saying that that, that life A is more meaningful than life. B. So, you know, somebody who's sitting in there, who does nothing more than sit in their basement, eating pizza, drinking beer and watching endless reruns of Game of Thrones. Um, is Have that you been life... spying on me the whole time? <laughs> <laughs> That's a lucky guess, Ian. <laughs> or is, is that life somehow less meaningful than somebody who gives their life to, you know, helping the homeless, working with medicines on frontiers, doing doing something? Or take it even to the to, to a larger degree take right now you know putin would tell us he has a meaning to his life it's flattening U- ukraine and trying to rebuild this dream of the greater russia i think i hope i imagine we would all agree there is something desperately wrong with that that's not just a valid meaning of life that he's picked there is a way of assessing that and i think we do naturally begin assessing meanings i think i think that one of the slippery things i've noticed here that gets us into trouble is i think the word meaning gets us into trouble. We'll often throw that word around without really thinking about the meaning of meaning, if you get my meaning. Um, And I think normally when we use that word, 
we're implying that something has been put in from from outside. That's why, where if you if you take a bag of Scrabble Scrabble letters and throw it on the ground, and someone said to you, "Oh, that's a fascinating collection of letters. I can see the meaning here." you would realise there's a problem going on in the same way if someone opened up one of my books or your books, one of your articles you'd written, we could talk about the meaning therein. I think meaning has to come to some extent from outside. I don't disagree that you cannot, you could choose to find something meaningful, but I think at that point you're describing your emotional reaction to something. You're not describing any feature that is actually there. I do think it's very hard on atheism to get beyond that blunt reality that we are the result of time plus chance plus natural kind of selection. That was the thing that led to the despair of people like, you know, Sartre and Camus and others, even Russell actually. I mean, you say Russell's cheerful, but his famous, you know, A Free Man's Worship uh, essay where he ends up talking about, you know, the only on the foundation of unyielding despair can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. I mean, he did have his un pretty much depressive moments um, and he that had a bad day. Famous reflection. Yeah. Had, that was a bad day. So that. So I think. Yeah. I think the moment we start assessing meanings, uh, and when we think about the word meaning, I think we're we're getting close to the recognition mm. that meaning is something that has to be input from with, in from without. So can we? As I think it's important to distinguish two things here, right? So one of them is. And we can sort of work around the, the word itself, but ultimately existential meaning. Hmm. And the other is political philosophy. So hmm. the danger of going from relative sort of worth, as, as I was talking about in the Plato example, to relative ism, which is, I think, where you go to in the Putin example, is that's the point that I think we've crossed over from existential into political philosophy. Because when it comes to the, the systems by which we navigate human society, we rely, I say we, I don't know whether you guys agree, but on liberalism, okay? And basic liberalism does have universal values. Those universal values have no need for a god. They are simply conditions by which we navigate human society so that everyone has as much freedom as an individual as possible. And as long as individual freedom is the moral criteria by which you organize a political society, it is not the case that you slip into relativism along the Putin can do what he wants, you know, Putin is no different to a Tibetan monk or, or something like that. But I think one of the big concerns that religion has always had um, is, is being unable to distinguish between liberalism and relativism. So you see it, so if you look at sort of, you know, the Bismarck era with Culture Camp and the sort of the Catholic pushback against the sort of liberal secular attacks then, most of that Catholic rhetoric is about relativism. And it is almost identical in content to the kind of uh, rhetoric you see from American sort of evangelical groups in their own culture wars in sort of the 80s and 90s in the US and that you see in some places now. And that, I think, is, is a fundamental sort of category error, that it's not really a discussion of relativism, it's a discussion of individual liberty. And on that basis, if individual liberty matters, you are unable to act as Putin in a way which crushes the individual liberty of the Ukrainians. You see what I mean? So you don't need to slide all the way into that. So this discussion to me, uh, because I don't think we're, we're here to talk about political philosophy, we can sort of block off that objection and it's more about the existential meaning you have through relative value. I, I mean, it, it is fascinating. I mean, obviously this is your area and you, you've, you've, you've written a book along these lines as well, Ian, but... Um, are you saying then that that you you kind of take it as a base line, as it were, that individual freedom and so on matters liberty? I mean, it sounds like a slightly John Rawls type kind mm. of you know um, way of approaching it that you have to have this, and then once you've got that in place, then people may, you can can build whatever meaningful life they have as long as long as we've all kind of basically been given the same right to liberty and freedom and so on. Uh, the interesting thing is that within liberalism, there's quite a fierce debate and has been for for decades even centuries now, on the extent to which what you do with your freedom is or isn't a meaningful life, right? So if you go back to the Victorian period, you go to John Stuart Mill or something, Harriet Taylor, they will say, well, a meaningful life does not involve the base pleasures, you know, eating and shagging and, and drinking and all of that. They think that if you get the chance to do those things or read philosophy, you're going to read philosophy. Now that is, I mean, extremely controversial as a proposition, and I violently disagree with it, but nevertheless, that's what they think. In the 20th century, you get people like Isaiah Berlin who are going to say, 
there really isn't one way to do it. You know, we're all bundles of values and of yearnings and of aspirations as cultures and as individuals. And you might want to have a life of, you know, celibacy, you know, in the church or of, of a warrior lifestyle fighting people, or you might want to sit and eat stuffed cross pizza and watch Game of Thrones. And these are all kind of equally valid as long as you're not interfering with someone else. But whichever way you go on those, the universal value that applies is the freedom of the individual and the interpretation of that proposition. Hmm. Andy. Oh gosh, there's so many things in there I would uh, I'd like to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is the fascinating discussion. I mean, not least because politically, if, if we were going to sort of frame it, you know, in terms of political philosophy, I probably am equally kind of. I would call myself a kind of classic, kind of kind of liberal. I think where I would differ a little bit from Ian is in a couple of things. Firstly, I'm not sure that it is obvious that freedom is a basic value. Not least again to go, you know, to connect it into those bigger philosophical questions. There's a, bit, there's a huge controversial question around whether we are free. If we live in a purely naturalistic universe, I'm not sure that we are. This gets us into philosophy of mind and all kind of, all kind of other areas of uh, rabbit trails we could go down. But if literally everything is particles in motion, then we're sitting here thinking we're having this lovely conversation with our sort of freely held opinions, but but we are not. It's very hard, really, to sort of, re re sort of ground, I think, freedom materialistically is the first thing i think secondly as those who are of a liberal persuasion i think we kid ourselves slightly we like the idea of freedom there are other worldviews out there there are there are political political ideologies out there that have done quite well actually uh that don't have freedom as that core value and obviously putin we mentioned that's a sort of you know fairly easy one to to put forward but say the chinese uh would be would be another i think that's a society that's trying to structure itself quite differently, quite tragically, I think I would say, when you look at what's happened to the Uyghurs uh, and others. And so I don't think you can quite so neatly separate the existential question, Ian, and the, and the political question. I think they do, they do run together. Because uh, obviously, ultimately, certainly in, in ethics, you know, everything ultimately comes down to that question of ought. Uh, where do we get the ought from? We ought to maximise someone's freedom. You ought not to restrict somebody's. That's a massive great philosophical elephant in the room and I think sometimes as li those of us who have a liberal persuasion politically we sort of conveniently forget that we just sort of pretend we can we can carry on without without asking those questions and of course Isaiah Berlin you mentioned there towards the end it was Berlin I think sort of famously again to paraphrase you know tries to tease out this difference between freedom from and freedom to which is interesting so often when we talk about freedom we think we're free if no one's restraining us saying so, you know, no one's got a gun to justin's head forcing him to say things a particular way or to you know is that or to or to wear that cheeky little grin that he likes to entertain everybody with he's chosen freely to do that um so he's free but there's that's only that's only one view of freedom the other view of freedom is what was our freedom designed to be for is there something that we that to be truly freely human authentically human is the thing we should be aiming for as you say that's hugely controversial i realize in, in liberalism so we don't like those value judgments but i i don't think we can avoid making them and very quickly i don't think we do avoid making them because one of the things that struck me as i read your i spent a happy morning going through loads of the pieces you'd written for uh for uh for i and to go the the value judgments are everywhere this is bad this is good this is right this isn't of course um mm. Kind of thing. I of think course. journalism would be desperately bland if we just said, <laughs> "Hey, you know, we can't really, uh, you know, assess people's people's freedom." Um, but of, of course, of, can I, I, mean, can, I can I get you to come back on that after a quick break? In we're just going to go to yes, a, right. our, our break, and I, I will get you. So hold that thought, and we'll come back on it. We're already getting into some really interesting philosophical territory. We will we'll return to the, the the actual funeral as well that we started with as well uh, towards the end of today's show. But uh, Ian Dunt and Andy Bannister are my guests here on Unbelievable today. We're talking about religious funerals and religion in general. Is it empty and platitudinous? But what do we do as a shield against existential despair? We'll continue the conversation in just a moment. Have you ever found yourself tongue-tied when someone asks you, is there evidence for God? What about suffering? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? I'd like to introduce you to Confident Christianity, our online apologetics course, featuring video training from world-renowned thinkers such as William Lane Craig, John Lennox, Amy Orr Ewing and Gary Habermas. You'll learn how to understand, defend and share your faith with confidence. I'll also share lessons I've learned from over 15 years of hosting atheists and Christians in dialogue. You can enrol now at premier.org.uk forward slash course or click the link with this video.
Welcome back to the show. We're asking, are religious funerals empty and platitudinous? Uh, That was the gist of a tweet that Ian Dunt, who's a journalist and an atheist, sent out during the Queen's State funeral. Andy Bannister responded with an article on our own Premier Unbelievable website. Uh, I'll link to both Ian's account and that that, that article by Andy and indeed uh, their websites too from today's show. Um, But yeah, we've just gone into a really interesting conversation on freedom and liberty and value and meaning and uh, and, and ultimately Ultimately, uh, Andy saying, when I read your articles, Ian, you're really concerned about values, about right, wrong, truth, um, you know, justice and so on. Um, and, and I guess the, the implication is, uh, you know, if, if we are living in an ultimately a place where there isn't that kind of foundation, there isn't that uh, platonic or, or whatever it is sort of uh, standard by which we can judge all things. Uh, do, do you even have a right to kind of say, well, this is right and this is wrong in the end? Yes, I mean, I, 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 I find that a very silly question <laughs> because of, it seems obviously the case that you would. Um, you come up with value judgments on the basis of your beliefs. Now, the beliefs should be grounded in reason. Now, the origin of the belief system that I happen to have, and, and that I, I think Andy does as well, as well, for me, ultimately starts with, with Descartes, and it's the moment that Descartes accidentally kills God. Now, he doesn't mean to do it, right? When he's writing the meditations, Descartes plans to rebuild God after he's, ex- you know, exerted this sort of sustained attack of doubt. But his, his arguments, and I think pretty much everyone accepts this now, 400 years after the controversy, his arguments for rebuilding God are not strong arguments. They're by far the weakest arguments that this extraordinary genius ever put forward. But his arguments for doubt are very strong. What he ended up with was the cogito, I think, therefore I am. And that is the foundation of the individual, that the one thing you can demonstrate without doubt is that you exist as an individual and are thinking. That's the crucial part. You are mm-hmm. thinking. You are using reason, and it's upon reason that you discover your own existence. Now, from there, liberalism creates an extraordinary, ornate, very rambunctious you know, bad-tempered political philosophy because it's full of liberals who won't do what they're told. Um, and part of that story is a religious story. You know, that, that part of that is the Puritans, especially during the English Civil War and that Protestant movement of going like, we don't know how to worship. Now, we're going to find out, we're going to experiment with worship. No one has the right, whether it's Archbishop Lord or, you know, the Papists or whoever else, to tell us how to worship. We have to be free to experiment with different kinds of worship. Now, that was the origin of the, of the liberal political system, was from within sort of radical Protestantism, essentially, um, that blossoms outwards. And that is the objective basis upon which the freedom of the individual becomes important because of the concept of doubt. Because we don't know how to do things. Why does freedom of speech matter? Because we don't really know what the truth is. So we have to allow different ideas, different opinions to come forth so that we can try to assess it. It's because of doubt, because of the need for hypotheses, that we require freedom of the individual on the absolute basis of reason. So it does have a grounding. I mean, it has a grounding. It's not a grounding that relies on an external agent. It is internal to the human species but it is an absolute grounding upon which you construct the rest of your political philosophy mm. Mm. andy um yeah i'd like day day car i mean where do we where do we start i mean it's, it's, it's interesting, interesting sort of personally actually i think there's an interesting parable there in in the overreach of reason that you sort of as you say you come up with what you think is this clever cast iron argument and then suddenly oh dear um what i do think happens though is i think actually it's more drastic than, than, than you realise, because you say, you know, 400 years on, we've reassessed that. But I think it's been continually reassessed. And one of the reassessments is actually, I think, therefore, I am, is not as robust as I think mm-hmm. Descartes thought it, it was. I mean, firstly, you know, he had this idea of, you know, if, if a sort of, you know, demon is interfering with your thinking, how can you be sure of anything? Well, the one thing I can be sure is I'm thinking, well, actually, can you be sure that you're your thinking is this just itself an illusion and of course we now have this whole branch of philosophy of mind that has gone down that rabbit trail of going well thinking doesn't exist i can point you to dozens of quite scary kind of you know sort of hyper reductionists who think that consciousness is in fact uh, mm-hmm. an, an, an illusion and then of course the, going the other direction you have atheists like thomas nagel uh you know who has almost got himself back to theism if not quite <laughs> by building from consciousness going forward is going that actually if there is if there are such things as thoughts 
in the universe, if those are not reducible to atoms and particles and, and so on, then at the very least, even in that, in that process of thinking that you've spoken so highly of, we actually have potentially something that is, you know, whether we use the word supernatural, but certainly super material. Um, and so I think there's a whole discussion we could have uh, around that. And I'm very intrigued you use the word objective basis, because I say I'm, I, I think what's fascinating is human beings, we need that foundation. You're clearly looking for something to stake, you know, your your political philosophy on. I appreciate you feel that 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 need that you think you found it in thinking. I guess my my question would be, why not sort of subject the kind of sort of uh, the basis of thinking and reason and, and so on that uh, that you've got there? Why not subject that to the same sort of scepticism that you went through with your religious faith and shake that? foundation too because somebody once said skepticism is actually a universal acid it does actually destroy everything and i think there could be a tendency sometimes in atheism with a really the greatest of respect to sort of stop and go well this far and no further we we need something but i think i would say other atheists have come along and gone, well, what if there is absolutely nothing uh if there is nothing down there and why does it matter why does truth matter that's the other interesting question you know i love that crusading part of you that comes through there but ultimately who gives a flying monkeys if 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 Bertrand Russell is right that it's all going to end in the in the, in the, in the decay of a universe in ruins? Why worry? Why not just get on with it? Give yourself over <laughs> to hedonism and be done with it. So I think so. To answer the first um, question, I think that the problem with the reasoning that you're using is that you are treating um, critique and skepticism of an idea as a basis by which you could not legitimately hold it. Now, of course, you're entirely right on sort of, you know, the critiques, especially around categories of words that actually, once again, we come back to Russell and Wittgenstein would have used on Descartes. Nevertheless, it doesn't matter that someone critiques it. There is no idea in the existence of humanity that has not been critiqued and subject to various strong and, and weak responses. What's a description here, of course, is, is of my philosophy. It is not my demand that others hold it. It's just that this is the form of liberalism that I have. Typically speaking, the arguments you have within liberalism are much more brutal <laughs> than the ones you have with people outside of liberalism, because, again, they're a bunch of liberals. So it doesn't, it doesn't require, the, the problem I think with the argument that you just expressed is because it can be subject to critique and exactly the same as you say for thought or arguably free will on the basis of causation, then it cannot just be, you know, held as that, but you can hold it if you believe in it. And there would of course be certain things that we would hold ourselves, I presume like all of us would sign up to, I don't know, you know, evolution or human rights or something like that, that there are sustained and actually some quite good critiques from various positions that you could hold and it wouldn't necessarily affect your your belief in it so that part doesn't doesn't sort of i, I don't think adds up to, to to a very effective argument um mm. the second part is why have anything you know why have any sort of belief at all and i mean ultimately a lot of your morality will come down to when, when you're of this persuasion that agent a wants agent b to behave towards them in the way you know that they that they are going to behave towards them now that is as you know uh in the Bible, which is, you know, do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. But it is also a secular proposition, or can be, because you're saying in order for this social organism to function, the codes that would be followed is that agent B wants to be treated in the way to agent A that he demands for himself. And for that, you get an overall package. Now that, to me, opens up realms of freedom that you wouldn't otherwise have. That's why we have a thing that sort of says, like, I can do whatever I want as long as I'm not interfering in your freedom to do whatever you want. These are the very basic, almost childlike moral rules that we have. And I would call those objective, not because they exist in the structures of the universe, but because they are required for the subjective assessment of our own human flourishing. So, so there's a kind of a social contract in a way, Ian, to, to quote Rousseau, that, that you would say you kind of have to have in order to get anything done essentially and and while you're not saying this exists written somehow in the fabric of the universe it's it's a helpful thing just at, at a practical level almost to, to kind of to, to to get on and, and do things as a human species yeah i mean but don't you think it's funny to even sort of question that in that you know i'm aware that religious societies function according to these kinds of contracts and you know function well and they have mm. rules against murder and you know all sorts of other stuff and of course it's the case the secular societies do as well, whether they're sort of formalist, formally secular mm. at the government level or whether they're like ours, which 
I think probably the two of you would agree are fundamentally quite secular societies, regardless of the fact that, you know, we have a state church and things like that. I mean, they do function that way. We do have a series of laws. They are based on ideas. And we do have a series of social norms, which are also based on ideas, which predominantly do not derive from religious thought. But but they're, they're sort of they, they have to be there is what I'm hearing from you. It's kind of like that. that's your base kind of assumption that you just it, it's almost objective in that kind of way. You, you, oh, of course. Yeah, you don't yeah, get I anywhere. Mean, so, yeah. so that's I, I guess I'm interested in your response to that, Andy, because I, I think mm. Ian saying is an is an atheist. I I do have an objective standard, and and it it, it just kind of needs to be there. This this kind of acceptance that we yeah. Uh, have I think again, it's a um, you know. couple of thoughts here actually. I mean, with, without necessarily going totally down this this particular rabbit hole. I mean, on the one hand, you mentioned secular society. I think I think Justin and I, if we had time, might might tease out whether that's actually true. I know. I think Justin, you've had Tom Holland you know on the on the show and he among others you know has sort of uh sort of pointed out maybe this society is not quite as secular as you think it might be a lot of the foundations you know human rights and other whatnot are far more christian than i think we we realize which is interesting but objective is interesting i think i think a lot comes down to the use of words i don't want to you know we don't, we don't sort of bore listeners with you know constant discussions about what terminology means but traditionally i think in philosophy objectives mean it exists outside of our of, of ourselves even if nobody believed it even if not a single human being believed this proposition it would still be objectively true classic example you know two plus two is four or in fact there's a table in front of me um doesn't matter if no one believes that the fact of the matter is it's still a table and if i walk forward towards the window i'm still gonna crash myself into it um so th- in that sense they're being objective I, i'm not sure ian has found objective bedrock and your point about critique ian i wasn't suggesting that because it can be critiqued therefore it's up for grabs i would go further and say i think the critique stands i think actually that i think the the arguments against you know reason and freedom and those pieces uh of the jigsaw that you've sort of built together i think do stand up and i think the challenge on atheism is i do think you need to give a an argument that stands up for reason you do need to have an argument that stands up for uh for freedom uh and some of those other pieces that have used human rights and so on just to come in on that the 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 you know going back to the putins and the maos and you know uh, at the risk of invoking godwin's law hitler and so on you've got you've got (laughs) lots of people in, in the world who have simply had a different idea of what um you know the social contract should be what the the liberal yes. order should look like and what their values are compared to you know western democratic yeah. society well, and so so yeah. so i, I kind of wanted to t- toss that back to you Ian, to say what what do you do just on the basis that you know at, at one level you know if you just took a purely you know why shouldn't someone just who has the power do mm. create the world around them that they want to create why should they abide by your particular moral perspective on 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 what a flourishing society looks like yeah um (laughs) the reason again at the risk of repeating myself is because of the value of individual liberty and where you hold this as liberalism does as the universal value and we then disagree on what that means in terms of material wealth or or you know contested rights of course but on the universal value itself that's how you differentiate it that really was why in the 60s the left that sort of veered towards kind of the more Foucault-y kind of area started to get in such tremendous trouble because its critique of liberalism was ultimately based on a kind of relativism. And once you go down that road, once you say, okay, well, ultimately, aren't all of our values just an expression of ourselves and our time period and nothing else? You very quickly find yourself going, oh, so on what basis do you critique imperialism? And on what basis do you critique sort of the Holocaust? So you, of course, I mean... There really is. It's such a tiny little cul-de-sac of predominantly left-wing thought relativism that leads you down that alleyway. I mean, nobody else really has that problem. Conservatives don't have it. Liberals don't have it. Socialists don't have it. Christians don't have it. It is, you know, I think it's a very, it's, it's a subculture of a subculture that has never gotten very far because of its own internal inconsistencies. Can I I I Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I mean, th- my counter question, I guess, on, mm. on this basis would be, um, do you, have you yourself noticed in life that mm. there is a moral distinction between the atheists and the theists that you know? Do you find that the atheists that you know that you've come across have a sort of lower moral standard, that they're more likely to lie, to cheat, mm. to, to assault or, or anything like that? 
Let me just um, make a quick point and then I'll, I'll, I'll answer that because it's just something I wanted to say earlier. I'd, 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 I'd forgotten to, to make this point. I mean, one of the things I think, Ian, that you and I may differ on as well is I am not as positive about how, how uh, robust liberalism is. I, I worry at some of the trends right now because as somebody who politically would have been a classic old school kind of liberal, that was the world I grew up in and you, know, you and I have read a lot of the same writers some of the trends in society right now worry me that uh, that you know liberalism is in increasingly seen as a dirty word. Your comments mm-hmm. about, rel- about relativism, you know, having just come back from doing quite a lot of stuff in schools, I do a lot of stuff in universities. I actually sometimes occasionally come back quite terrified, actually, at, mm. at what is going on in some of those in, among some of those sort of student communities of going and and you know I will often be found myself making as much of a defence as liberalism as I would of Christianity of going dudes. You know, free speech, free thought, liberal values, they're, they're, they are there for a good reason. Um, but you don't always get that affirmed. Back to your mm-hmm. point about, about behaviour. Um, no, I would say, I'd say I, entirely, I entirely agree with you. I, I think actually, you know, uh, there is not often a moral difference. Some of the most, uh, you know, moral folks I know are, are, are atheist friends. That to me, of course, is never the issue. The issue isn't behaviour. This is the foundations for it. And it's interesting, I mentioned schools. I've just come back from doing a, a, a tour, a speaking tour down in Jersey, and we did a lot of high school lessons. And one of the things we did was a lesson on human rights. And so you've got a bunch of kids who are probably 95% not Christian. And I always start the same way. I'll tell some story of some human rights abuse that's suitably age appropriate. And then I'll ask the class to say, okay, who, who thinks what happened there was wrong? And normally the majority are like, it was wrong, which is great. It's always terrifying when you discover a sociopath at the back of 5B. <laughs> but then when you ask the follow-up question, okay, well, tell me why it's wrong. Then you crash into this this barrier. And I, I forget the name of the writer. It was an amazing article I came across in a, in, a, in a teacher's magazine in Ontario about seven years ago when I was still in Canada, written by, um, by an educational psychologist, no religious faith, as far as I know, and he made this comment. He said, "He said I'm terrified that we're producing a generation of moral paralytics, and that they know the right answer on lots of these big issues. Yes, Putin wrong, uh, you know, Brexit bad, whatever it is. But then when you ask them what are the reasons, they can't give you any. And so with my atheist friends, for example, I've had you know that will often be where I'll start conversations. Actually, you know, have you ever wondered?" You know, why you've stuck the Amnesty International sticker on the back of the car. You know, have you ever wondered why we get animated about the treatment of the Uyghurs uh, or, or whatever it is? What is it that we're, 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 we're plugged into there? We clearly are agreed that Nietzsche was wrong. It's not the will to power. But my reasons for that would be firmly rooted in the Bible's understanding that we are made in the image of God. I wouldn't go primarily to treat others as you would have them treat you, although that's important. Jesus taught that. I'd go right to the very first page of Genesis that there is something fundamentally valuable and precious about human beings. That would be my objective building block. But it's objective because I would believe it's there by the creator. So it is external to us. And it's true in the same way that two plus two is four. It's true in the same way there's a table in front of me. I much prefer that to um, the, that kind of background hum that I often find in religion, uh, which is this idea of you will, you will do good in life because of the judgment you may face in death, which seems to me just a form of very elevated blackmail and not a moral behavior at all, really. Mm. Um, so the idea of the creation in, in the image of God is, is a much nicer idea. Obviously, one that I couldn't possibly, you know, have any sympathy with, but a better one. <laughs> Do you find, is your concern then that it's not in the, so we've established, and it's and good on you for saying it. So we've established that it's not in the product, the moral product of the behavior of secularists that there's a problem. But that you think that in your experience, when you've sort of interrogated the premises, I guess, by which they would arrive at that product, that they don't hold together, they don't make a coherent whole in what the majority of people or, or, or anyone? I would say certainly the majority of people, I think, in, in, in my view. And I think for good reason. I think, obviously, I think, look, if ultimately we, we, are, we would both be people, I think, who would be wanting to believe things because they're true. So I think if, if Christianity is true, it should stand up to rigour and it should, it should also work pragmatically in the, in the real world. And I think it gives you a, a fantastic foundation for a whole range of things. There's a whole range of things that fit better with the Christian worldview, be that human rights or, you know, reason or consciousness or so forth. There's quite a broad spectrum argument you could put together there. Whereas I think those things on, on atheism don't 
sit nearly quite quite so well. So I think it's more the sense that I think, and this again, I mentioned Tom Holland earlier, that would be the thesis behind Dominion, um, that book that he wrote a couple of, two, three years ago, that actually there's, there's a lot of Christian substrata to, to the West and to liberal values that we don't we don't wholly appreciate. Just one observation, by the way. Thank you for your your kind words about you know where I go in terms of Genesis. I would cheekily say you're sitting quite nicely on that worldview. The 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 judgment piece. I think you're quite right to call that out. Other than the only little caveat, I would put um, Miroslav Volf, you know, well-known Croatian theologian, Yale University. I remember a few years ago read something he once said that was interesting. He said one thing that we perhaps don't wholly appreciate about the idea of the final judgment is is the other way is it applies the other way around in that if you take that seriously you don't need to seek revenge you know he talks about having grown up in a country where the spiral of violence is a very real thing if you do believe there is a god of justice and judgment if you do believe that people will ultimately be held to account even if they're not held account here that does mean that you no longer feel the need for vengeance and he says, I write that as someone in society who vengeance has been a massive issue. And the spiral of violence is a big feature of so many cultures. Um, so I think I think it's just thinking wisely about what that doctrine in the Christian faith unpacks in terms of. I certainly agree if your only reason for doing good is you sort of have the idea that God's going to ding you around the head if you don't. I think that's a very narrow spectrum view of Christian ethics. Right? Whereas, the, whereas the Bible, I think, would start from that that you know that value in every person you know jesus reduced the whole of the old testament to two commandments right love god with all your heart mind and soul love your fellow human being as yourself hang everything on those two pegs and the rest of ethics follows hmm. do you i mean so you call yourself a liberal and a, and a christian i find this interesting so if we were to take um the classic sort of john stuart mill you know, classic liberalism. So basically, you know, the, the maximum amount of freedom for the individual. Why? Because people want different things. We're not really sure what's true. They've got the bundles of different values. And this is the best way to make sure that everyone can reach their own flourishing. If you take that, what, do you consider that on its own without a Christian sort of background foundation? Do you consider that to be incoherent? In other words, do you think that liberalism is mm -hmm. impossible without Christianity? Yeah, I do. I already know my colours oh, the mask. I think for a couple of reasons. I think the first thing is, I think one of the flaws that is often there in, in, in liberalism, although it tries to, to make, you know, sort of factor in the understanding that human beings can be a bit like, monstrous to each other, I don't think it goes deep enough. And I think that Christian understanding of the fall, when properly, when properly applied, actually is a much more helpful corrective. And interestingly, you can even find people like, say, John Gray, you know, well-known atheist. I think he would identify himself probably as a liberal. Um, yeah, on a good day. Um, you know, John talks about this ridiculous myth of progress that's infected, you know, so much of liberal and humanistic thinking. Where he said, you know, the one thing that he, the, I think he says the one thing that he thought Christianity got right was the sense we have, was that understanding that we're fallen. And if you don't factor that in, if you think human beings are basically going to be decent to each other when left alone, you have a problem. Communism falls flat for the same reason. You know, perfect world where everybody did live out the ethic of Jesus, you probably could apply a lot of sort of Marxism and it would work really, really well. So I think liberalism, I think liberalism assumes a little bit too much. And then the flourishing piece, you know, connect back to, you know, your old friend Isaiah Berlin, who you brought in. I think liberalism has traditionally run a little bit scared from thinking about what does human flourishing actually actually look like um you know what's the maximization of, of freedom actually for is it he who dies the most toys wins or is there more to it than that i think there's more to it than that so i'm a i'm a, I'm a christian liberal in that sense politically i believe in maximizing freedom particularly of course freedom of belief and and conscious the old idea about i would you know disagree with you but i would defend to the death your right to to hold the beliefs that you do um but i think i would do that for profoundly christian reasons not in not some vague sense that freedom is somehow the, 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 the curve of history or the, you know, built into the fabric of the universe or something. Ours will have to be a very uh, pragmatic and tetchy comradeship in liberalism <laughs> that, we, that we will establish. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Many, many of the best liberals I know are, 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 are Christians um, and are unfairly uh, tarnished by virtue of their Christian uh, belief. Um, I, I don't... I, 
the full thing, I mean, seems an odd critique to me. And in the, in the, one of the, the things you typically hear, mostly from the left, is, you know, why, from John Locke onwards, is the whole system based on, you know, putting this fence around the individual against interference by others? And you get that all the way through, of like, this is how we protect the individual. And by virtue of that being very often the opening moral and political initiative... There is in it an implicit sense of, no, we tend to mess each other up really quite a lot. And of course, that's natural for liberals who, you know, most of the early liberal texts, you know, were written in jail cells from people who were being, you know, sort of oppressed and all, and all of that. So I, 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 I don't find there's too much of that. I mean, the mean, the, the human flourishing part is really where there is an extremely, that is mm. the toughest part for liberalism, you know, because when you, when, when you do specify what human flourishing is, I think that you start to edge towards the kind of oppression that liberalism is designed to extinguish. Because you start to say, well, you're not living your life right. You know, you're supposed to be jogging every day and, you know, mm. reading philosophy and, and, and whatever else. Um, not at the same time. Well, you never yeah. know. You know, we've got audio books. It can be done. I have literally <laughs> done this. I mean, I didn't enjoy it. It was like a combination of some of the most grueling activities a human being can undertake, but it can be done. Um, <laughs> the part of that is um, th th there is a sort of intuitive mm. resistance against the idea that all lives are valuable no matter how you live it, as long as you're not affecting the freedom of other people. But I do think that sort of the, the modern form of liberalism, which really finds its it's most complex and difficult and potentially dangerous, but ultimate very eloquent sort of defender in Isaiah Berlin is ultimately, no, we are bundles of values, you know, and you are going to have to make sacrifices with that. You know, I mean, one of his examples is, uh, oh, no, actually, no, I think that might have been one of mine that I used <laughs> when I was trying to explain him. But it's sort of, like, you know, that, that, you know, you have to go off to fight for your country. But if you do, you know, your elderly father who really needs help at home, you know, is, is, is going to be on his own and won't have that help. To, to Berlin, that's just, that is a human tragedy. Okay, is it a tragedy within every breast of every human being to face these kinds of choices? And there is no right answer to that stuff. It is one that kind of tries to restrain judgment. But it is not even then relativistic, because ultimately the criteria that it uses to assess that is still individual freedom. We, we'll, we'll come back to this if I can get you to hold that thought just for a moment, Andy. We're going I to another quick break um, and we will talk about funerals. In fact, I want to ask both of you how what you think your funeral will look like, <laughs> what you hope it'll look like um as well before we finish today's show but um on today's show we've we, we've we've gone well well past just uh, the state funeral of queen elizabeth to talk about all things philosophical uh liberalism uh individual freedom rights values whether there's a god behind all of that stuff we're talking with ian dunt and andy bannister on today's show and we'll be back for the final part in just a moment for more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter. Welcome back. And we're just going to finish up this conversation today. Um, it's been a really great one between Ian Dunt and Andy Bannister. Uh, gone all over the shop actually right back to cogito ergo sum you always know if a conversation goes back to descartes cogito ergo sum you're you're getting really deep um but anyway uh we, we started by talking about religious funerals especially in in terms of queen elizabeth's funeral ian dunt columnist with the i newspaper has been talking about why he tweeted that he feels ultimately those kinds of funerals are empty and platitudinous uh, and explaining why as an atheist he doesn't feel you need to have some kind of objective capital m meaning out there that actually as long as you've got individual freedom you can build uh, you know the kind of society that makes sense um andy bannister pushed you back against that a bit on today's show um so so uh, again there'll be there'll be links to both my guests from today's show do go and check out their stuff um andy i think you wanted to come back on some of the points mm. ian was making and and he's also blowing some amazing smoke rings as well while, while we're speaking i was uh i was gonna say he's busy vaping away i'm an occasional <laughs> cigar smoker but i i, I can't good. do anything, anything like what uh, what ian's producing there um yeah just a couple of th things that really struck me in what Ian said uh, a moment ago. Um, first was you told that story, Ian, of, you know, the, that classic, you know, one of those sort of classic scenarios where you've got two possible choices and whatever you do, the outcome is a bit miserable. You know, do you go and fight for the country against the oppressor, defend your country, but your, your elderly dad behind 
need your help and so forth. But I was very, very interested you, you use the word tragedy. You know, again, it's one of those sort of value judgment things sort of coming in that just in, intrigued me of going, you know, tragedy is interesting because, of course, built into tragedy is the is the implication that the world should be different. Um, whereas, you know, I would just sort of gently say maybe just on a purely naturalistic view of the world, there are just outcomes. Again, you know, back to our old friend Bertrand Russell, everything ends the same. There is no different. There may be some different pathways through there, but ultimately everything ends the same way. So the word tragedy was an interesting one. But then the other thing I wanted to pick up on was I think the other thing I feel we've danced around a bit in this conversation, I mean, it, it flows naturally out of the the flourishing piece, is the whole question called teleology. You know, what were, is there something that were designed for? I mean, that's a discussion that goes back, you know, century, you know millennia, right? I mean, Aristotle's famous four, four causes for anything. And, and, and one of the, the, the fourth one that's often neglected these days is, you know, the, 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 the sort of uh, the final cause, what something is, is designed for. And I think flourishing is closely linked to teleology. You know, if there is something that human beings are intended to be, then you can at least, while being careful not to be totalitarian or oppressive in the way you talk about it, you can then, I think, actually, you know, grasp that nettle of going, um, you know, this route is not necessarily one that is going to be helpful or where you're going to best flourish. And of course, why this really matters, then of course, ethics flows out of out of this, right? I mean, the, the example I'll often use when I'm teaching this to, you know, to, to students is, you know, if I were to say to you, that I'm in a slightly bad mood this morning, I'm, I'm hiding it, but I'm, you know, I'm in a slightly bad mood this morning. Um, because, you know, I'm really cross because I bought a new watch the other day and the jewellery store sold me a bad watch. And you would say, why was it a bad watch? And you'd say, well, last night I was putting up shelves for my wife and I was hammering and nails with the watch and I broke it. It's a bad watch. You would go, dude, I think you need to smoke a couple of cigars and chill out because, you know, watches are not designed for hammering and nails. They're designed for telling the time. And we determine whether a watch is a good watch or a bad watch by how well it aligns with that purpose. And you'd be right, teleology and and value actually fit very closely together i don't think unless you have teleology the same applies with human beings i think a whole series of things begin to collapse and as i say looking back at that you know hall of depressive atheists that we talked about at the start i think all of them the whole thing untangled when the teleology kind of went that's where we get you know everything is absurd that's where we get there is just literally no purpose there is no meaning um, once that final goal goes, that sense that life is for anything, then I think the whole the whole of the rest falls and, like and, a and, and I guess that that brings us back into to the whole question of you know well well how do you adjudicate between eating pizza and watching Game of Thrones in your basement and living this this life of charitable endeavour and everything else mm. that that Andy outlined without even having to go to you know the, the examples of Putin and everything else, but it, it's that question of you know is is there a something that life is for ultimately it, even if we kind of say we need this basic freedom just to be able to live the kinds of lives that where we can choose what we do without stepping on other people's cho toes you know do, where do you as an atheist go with that how do you say well this is how i construct what is a meaningful life e even if maybe i don't have the right to tell other people what what their kind of mm -hmm. meaning should mm -hmm. look like well, where do you go with it for yourself i guess i'm interested so it is individual to yourself you know, and mm. someone can have a meaningful life that is utterly alien to mine. Um, their only barrier being, as I've expressed before, that they can't interfere with anybody else's freedom. But they can have a life, you know, for instance, I would consider like a life in the military where you are not able to exercise your full autonomy as a human being to be, uh, for me, a tragic waste of, of a life and of human potential. But I do, as long as they are expressing their own life according to their own wishes not by virtue of what society expects of them or what they've taken from others then they're living a worthwhile life for themselves and that ultimately is why i mean in that isaiah berlin example it's a tragedy it's not a tragedy because of an you know an, an external objective sort of factor because of a, a sort of metrics of value it's a tragedy because the internal values of the individual have come into into contact, they're incommensurable with each other and have to break the strategy for them. What's interesting is as we have that conversation, we, you and I have discussed lots and lots of different things over the last God knows how long, 12,000 years that we've been talking. <laughs> but ultimately it always comes down to that, to that central thing that I think in, in your worldview, there has to be an external metric for there to be something meaningful there. And in mine, there does not. It is internal to human society. So I, and, and I think I can get us back to our subject matter here, which was the funeral, <laughs> we may remember. 
by virtue of this, of that, that sense of tragedy in Berlin is the same as what you ge very generously said at the beginning of the discussion when I was talking about the funeral of the couple shield against existential despair. Because there is no point pretending um, in my world, that, that there isn't existential despair. That is a thing that happens when someone dies. I mean, we mostly don't feel it, unless we're very unlucky, on a day-to-day -day basis. But we do feel it when someone dies. And it, it is hard, and I, I say all of this perfectly openly, it's hard, and probably harder for us a lot than you lot, um, when a friend or a family member dies, because we don't believe that we will ever see them again. Okay? And when we don't believe that you know, there is any further to that story, okay? that, that is the end of that story. The meaning that you try to salvage, I remember writing about a friend of mine that died and I had to grasp for this, but even then it takes days really before you can get to the point where that is graspable, mm. is that they live by virtue of the relationship that you had together and the things that you got from them, that human beings have meaning to each other. And by virtue of that, you know, we carry something of them in us and that the moments we had together mattered, even though they have now passed in time. These are flimsy scrapes from a, from a table that we have to go for what we do. Mm. But, you know, the counter to this is, and this shouldn't concern you. I mean, you guys have to do what you do because that's what you believe in. I get it. I totally get it. There is a very specific sort of loneliness that you get um, as an atheist when you go to a funeral, to religious funerals. Because you're mourning together with people, right, with friends and family, with other people that miss them. And then this whole new thing takes over, which is not, I mean, it may be in your lives, but in my life, this is not a thing that we typically talk about, of, oh, God, and, you know, you go off somewhere else. And I mean, none of that typically comes up. Suddenly, this whole new sort of conversation takes place. It was like, oh, and now, you know, everything's going to be okay because, you know, there is no, you know, there is life after death. And suddenly we're sat there, you know, and just think, oh, man, because we don't even have that. We absolutely do not have that, that reassurance. Mm. And in fact, we're mm. divided from those who we mourn with by virtue of some people there do think that. Um, so yeah, so, so that part, I'm not going to, there's no two bones about it. That part mm. sucks, but mm. it's better to suck on something that you think is true than to fool yourself on something that you don't think is true. Mm. I, I mean, first thing I'd say, Ian, I mean, hugely appreciate your honesty uh, in, a, in, in that. And to go, you know, I remember being struck by how how empty some of this can be that a few years ago now i'm mean, being at a at a funeral for a, for a cousin of mine who who tragically had taken his own life and so they had a they had a humanist kind of funeral and i will vividly remember the line that the i think the celebrant that was the title for the person who did the mm -hmm. you know business used at the end was he said well you know he said jonathan will live on forever in our memories and i remember afterwards thinking even talking to, to friends who are not christian saying that's not true I can't remember, I don't know the names, I can't remember the names of my great-grandparents or my great-great-grandparents. It's a lovely idea that that somehow is, is, is comfort, whereas, I, whereas I, think, I think it isn't. I think the interesting question occurs to me, of course, is as to why there's existential despair. I mean, because I think the thing that, you know, the platitudinous part that you wrote about in that tweet, I, I get a bit worried when Christians get a bit too sort of cocksure of themselves and go, we don't need to worry, someone's died, it's all all right, they're going to heaven and be with Jesus. <laughs> that is not what the New Testament frames it. We're told, yes, we grieve and yes, we mourn, but we don't mourn as people without hope. And I think, you know, a robust biblical Christian faith, you know, takes seriously that, that death is death is a, is a sad thing. It's not a tragedy, it's not the end of everything, but it's still desperately sad. Jesus at Lazarus's grave wept. Um, and I think Christians sometimes need to just take de take these things a little bit more seriously, a bit more emotional depth to it. But the question still remains, I think, for the atheist position, why is death an existential despair? It's part of, it's part of the great cycle of life, right? And, and, and that was my thought about your tweet, Ian, when you first put it out, was, well, I find humanist celebrations, whether it be for marriages or deaths or whatever, quite empty and platitudinous now that may just be where i'm Ouch. coming from but when someone says oh you know we're all made of stardust and you know that has some significance or as andy said you know we'll all live on in each other's memories i think actually i find that quite empty and platitudinous it, it doesn't really mean anything to me i find something you know and again I'm coming from a position as a christian i find something far more substantial in the kinds of scriptures that were preached and quoted at the queen's funeral because it feels like something like meaningful it feels whereas i find just saying we're all made of stardust and you know you'll 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 end up you know being someone's 
tuna on a you know in their sandwich or something and be part of their body or whatever it is i don't know it it it, it sounds lovely and poetic until you actually kind of think okay but does it uh, do you know what i mean it, it, have you guys got anything better when it comes to the the emptiness and the platitudinous and i mean you said you wanted it to be more human and i fully get that i fully get that investing a kind of personal element to it but but i suppose it's still the question of does does that does that do enough to, to kind of ward off this this existential kind of question you see the thing is that in my world we're all in the same boat right because in my world it's you die okay and when you die you're dead mm-hmm. and so you guys are in the same boat as i'm in it's just that we're not choosing to think about it in the same way <laughs> but to me that you you will be no more or less dead than i am you know when when, when you die mm-hmm. so to me it's like we're, we're all experiencing that existential horror because that it, there's no other way of looking at it there's no, there's in a sense you know it's to fool yourself to think otherwise about it so when we grasp for they live on in our memories which sounds platitudinous I, it isn't platitudinous when i think about it in individual instances you know i think about an uncle who meant a tremendous amount to me like a, a huge amount to me and he does live on in my instances like when i think of him when he informs my actions my conceptions of beauty or my moral sense or my idea of who i am like those are that, that does not feel remotely sort of meaningless to me that 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 feels deeply imbued with meaning it is a sad meaning and utterly insufficient compared to what you wish for, which is that death does not exist, but the only one that's available. I wonder, you know, if someone said something to me after that tweet of um, a Christian said, um, made the distinction between the way that um, uh, marriage ceremonies are done. Now, I do not feel the same way about marriage ceremonies. I've been to plenty of religious marriage ceremonies and I've seen some appalling ones which were basically sort of half concealed arguments against gay marriage <laughs> I just thought i can't believe you even exist as anything other but a bundle of cobwebs but nevertheless i've also seen some really really good ones and i, see, I, I remember seeing one obviously in east london of course which was this which again a religious ceremony but but described love as um an act of rebellion against death and i remember finding that like a very beautiful mm. phrase and i found the whole of the ceremony really good you know why because we share a commitment to love, right? Secularists, atheists, theists, we believe in and like the idea of love. When it comes to death, it is a very divisive thing between us because we fundamentally do not agree on what it entails. And while that's the case, I suspect that we will always be in this position where I will hear your stuff and think it's platitudinous and you'll hear my stuff and think it's platitudinous because we just have a very, very fundamental, existential, if you will, Mm -hmm. disagreement on what death is. Mm -hmm. I, I I think that's very true, which is also why I think trying to dig down, as we've done a bit in this conversation, to the foundations of the stories that we're living in can be can be helpful because i agree we are to some extent going to talk past each other find different things platitudinous i mean i think i think that point <laughs> i love the way lot... that i've imbued this conversation with that word <laughs> now everyone is, I, I just it. it's just such a good word i feel the need to now uh, go and <laughs> insert it into every day so i try i do this well i do this one with the crossword i'll come up with some new word and then i'll irritate my household by deploying you know sort of, sort of multifarious in everyday conversation um the things i do find interesting but the point about love being a rebellion against death is interesting because i do think we're running a rapidly out of time so this is a conversation for another time why we feel the need to rebel against death i mean i one of my you know sort of sort of heroes all our heroes are feet of clay right one of my heroes for a long time was you know steve jobs founder of apple computer um you know you know classic liberal in many ways uh, as well as a great technologist and he gave that amazing speech at, i think it was stanford university shortly before he died when he knew he was dying of cancer and he just talks about he tries to brush death away as go oh, death's great you know it clears out the old and it makes way for the new almost trying to turn it into this you know what's the problem it's 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 fantastic it's the ultimate upgrade really you don't want to keep your old iphone you want to keep the old human being lying around but your point i think is the more instinctive reaction that we feel the need to rebel against against death actually we don't feel it's natural we do feel it's 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 not right we rage against it Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which does raise to me that little question about why it is we feel existential despair as far as i know squirrels you know don't sit around having questions about what happens when i die why am i going to die it's all terrible they just worry about where the next nut is coming from you know your 
you know, we talked earlier, you've got a little dog sitting next door, you know, dogs, when they haven't got something to do, just sort of sit there and sort of sleep and let the world go by. But human beings, we rage against death. We, we yearn for meaning. We long for purpose. Um, you know, either something has gone, it does make you wonder whether either evolution has played some rather cruel trick on us, because these are things that are not, there's nothing on atheism there to fulfill, or if the very fact we ask the questions tells us there is something more going on and that's the that's the piece that intrigues me hmm. um final question final what question. what do you think your funeral will look like ian i'm not allowed to decide because <laughs> i told the missus what i want i told her which songs i wanted played and she said she wouldn't play them because it's too cheesy and she'd be embarrassed <laughs> so it's been made very clear to me that i've got no control over that so what's situation. the song come on give us one of, an example of a cheesy song then what would you have I, well i wanted i wish i knew how it felt to be free by nina simone i also wanted just for laughs to play goodness gracious great balls of fire when i'm cremated <laughs> just, just for the gag and she was just like well i'm not going to do any of it so i now know i have no control over this well well, Ian, I, 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 I hope that that day is a long way off, but um, <laughs> when it much. comes, maybe, maybe Great Balls of Fire will ring out in the <clears throat> crematorium. Who knows? Um, Andy? Um, <laughs> well, any I was slightly like sober because I was just commenting before we started recording that I was reading some of Ian's writings earlier. He'd written this piece on how everything suddenly changed when, he when you turned 40 earlier in the year and you found youth had gone when well, i turned 50 last week so does that mean the, the funeral is is accelerating rapidly <laughs> down uh down down the runway i definitely would like a bit of comedy because that's the way i am i think it would be fun to have something that makes people smile but very seriously i think i would like drawing on something ian said actually i would like a funeral that all who are there whatever they believe there's something they can they can engage with but i would also want something that hope at the the centre of it. And I think the key to me would be having that hope explained. Don't just start to use the language and assume that people there get it. I would like to have a Christian funeral, but one that helps explain to those who don't share my faith convictions why I why I felt this and that people would then walk away, you know, with a little bit of hope as well as a mm. sense of, you know, he's 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 gone. Some might celebrate that I've gone, actually, but you know, you never know. The kids <laughs> might go, Great, there's the inheritance. Um <laughs> but no. Something a bit funny with a bit of depth to yeah. it and some integrity and with Jesus at the centre of it, which I think was the great thing about the queen's funeral actually the focus was was on something bigger i'll i'll come and play the bagpipes andy as well all right Just so you know. <laughs> that assumes I'll, I'll that i go first mate yeah uh, you know you and i have jumped off uh you know scaffolding rigs onto airbags we before. have yeah so and my you know, life flashed you... before my eyes on exactly. that occasion as well we, so yes um well look it's been such a good good natured conversation thank you both ian and andy um i uh, i will direct people to the links as well uh to your twitter page ian and your podcast andy to solar cpc um but yeah really really inc enjoyed the conversation serious stuff uh, and we got into some you know quite deep stuff as well on the f philosophical political front but um it's been a great conversation so so ian and andy thank you for joining me cheers guys thanks very much it's been great to be part of it for more conversations between christians and skeptics subscribe to the unbelievable podcast and for more updates and bonus content sign up to the unbelievable newsletter